your notes from last week, uh, then you should have your notes with you, right? So uh, that's profound. <laughs> Anybody need a handout? That's unusual. Nobody needs a handout. In the back, in the overflow, John, we need some handouts. Anybody else? Okay. Need one, Dave? All right. John, on the opposite side of the building, somebody needs one. All right. Look, uh, it still needs to come. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know if the thing is set different tonight or what, but it's just, it's echoing. Can you check it out and see? It's, uh, it's real, real hot. I don't know why. I don't know if the A's are hotter tonight or what. All right. Let's look at our handout. And um, I want you to uh, notice with me there that we finished the Old Testament and we came into number 12, conception. Um, and in between Malachi and John the Baptist, which is kind of begins this section, the New Testament, uh, you got 400 what they call silent years, where God was silent. God didn't say anything to his people Israel. Now, now we lost too much. Yeah, a little bit more. They're like, just turn him off if he's not happy. And so Jesus Christ comes on the scene as the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. And, and during that 400-year period, you say, why did, why did God pick that time period for Christ to come? Because the Bible clearly says when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. So why was that the fullness of the, the, of the time? Well, we talked about the fact that during that 400-year period that... Uh, that, that Greece ruled the world for a time and brought a common language, which is important if the gospel is going to be spread. And then Rome came on the scene as a world power, and they connected the world physically. Uh, through, through their technological advancements, they were able to build roads and so forth and connect the world uh, in, in, a, in a way where communication would be uh, uh, much more easier, obtainable. They could, they could communicate easier and, and transportation uh, would, would, would be able to happen. So during that 400-year period, you got a common language. Now you've got the world more connected, and it's easier to be able to, uh, to travel. And so now the fullness of the time has come for the Messiah to be born. And so now the gospel could be spread rapidly, and it could be spread in a common language. And so that, that's, that's exciting to see that and to understand that. Now, if you look in your notes, last week we talked about the fact there are four different accounts of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, people call them the four Gospels. Uh, you know, the, the good news, uh, that Christ showed up, the Messiah came. And so you got four different, why? Why do we need four? Why not just one good, thorough account? Well, because... The four different accounts are going to minister during that time period to four different types of people. Matthew is focusing on the Jews and all how Christ fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies. Mark focuses on the Romans who really wouldn't care about all the prophecies uh, in the Jewish law. I mean, they're, they're Romans. And uh, the Romans were more, they wanted action. They wanted proof. And so Mark moves from event to event. And, uh, and more concise and to the point. Then Luke's focusing to the Greeks, who really tended to want to try to elevate humanity. So Luke presents Christ as the Son of Man that came to seek and to save that which was lost. And then John is, is more focused on the world as a whole. And uh, each one of them, it's interesting, Matthew's genealogy goes back to David because... To be the Messiah, you had to be an heir of David to sit on that Davidic throne, to fulfill that covenant. So he traces Christ's genealogy back to David. Mark, there's no genealogy because it's to the Romans. They wouldn't care about any of that. Just show me, man. Just give me some action. Uh, Luke's genealogy, because Luke's focusing on the Greeks and how they, they were focused on humanity, Luke's genealogy goes back to the first man, Adam. And then John, his focus is to the whole world, and so he traces Christ's genealogy directly to God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made manifest. The Word was made flesh, rather, and it dwelt among us. And so he just boom, he get, traces him right back to, to God Almighty, God in the flesh. 
in your handout, it says there that the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus was born of a what? Virgin. And we said that the virgin birth must be accepted by what? Faith, not by reason. You're not going to sit down and figure all that out, okay? Uh, and, and so when Jesus entered the world, it was God becoming man. And uh, boy, that's the, the mystery of all mysteries right there. God took on flesh. We've been studying Hebrews in our family devotions. And we went and we started in the, the first verse of Hebrews and we're working our way through. And uh, it, was, it was just so fascinating as we're going through there to, to see how that, you know, how that the Father calls the Son God in Hebrews 1. The Father addresses the Son and He says, Thy throne, O God. He says to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then in chapter 2 it talks about, though, how that Christ didn't take on the nature of angels. He took on the nature of mankind. And He took on our flesh and blood that He would be able to die and make reconciliation for us. And uh, so it's kind of exciting, you know, as we're, as we're going through that. We're also going through it a little slower in our pastoral meeting that we do once a week. And so that's kind of on my mind right now. But, but it's just so awesome, the virgin birth. God became flesh. In your handout, I think I gave you this last week, but we didn't talk about it at all. I just gave it to you. It says, of our Lord's infancy, only four events are recorded in the Gospels. Uh, go to Luke chapter number 2. I don't, I don't think we turned to any of these last week. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 21. The first one there is the circumcision of Christ eight days after his birth. Um, Luke 2, 21. Luke 2, 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And uh, so... You say, what, what, what's that all about? Well, circumcision was the sign of God's covenant with the nation of Israel. Um, if you study that out, which we've done here in church before, so we're not going to get into all of it again, but the, the, the covenant, this covenant promised that, that from Abraham would come a great nation in the earth. God would give this nation, which we know is Israel, the Canaan land area as an everlasting possession, everlasting. And God, and so, so God uses this rite of circumcision as a sign of that covenant that, that he made with Israel. And so God made a distinction between Israel and all the other nations of the earth. There was a distinction. The Bible says there was a wall of separation. And so, so there's this middle wall between Israel and the nations and circumcision was the physical sign of that division. How that God, they were a holy people. They were separated unto God. And so circumcision was a sign of that covenant. And it was a sign of the division that was there between the Jews and the other nations. And so, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Hebrews 2.16 talks about how that Christ took on him the seed of Abraham. So uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Well, who was his own? Who, who, was, who was Christ's own? The Jews, Israel. That's right. What I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say is that when you read of Christ's earthly life, you understand he was born a Jew. Okay? He was born of the seed of Abraham. He was circumcised here a Jew. He had the covenant that went along with it, the sign of the covenant that went along with it. Now go to Luke 2, 22. Go to the next verse, which is the next thing in your notes, the presentation in the temple. It says in verse 22, And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to pre present him to the Lord. Notice this, as, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice, notice what Mary and Joseph do, they offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So they come and they make this presentation of Christ in the temple which the, which the law required. Now, now listen very closely. Galatians 4.4, 4, Paul said, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. Now listen, made of a woman, made under the law. 
made under the law. Jesus Christ came and he came to fulfill the law, which we're going to see a little bit later on in this. Okay? He didn't come as a renegade thinking he was above the law and didn't have to obey the law of Moses. No, from his infancy, he would fulfill every, every um, law of Moses to the letter. Look with me down at Luke 2 and notice after the presentation in the temple, notice what it says in Luke 2.39. Luke 2.39. It says, and when they, that's his parents, when they had performed, and what's the next two words? All things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Obviously, we don't do all that today when we have kids, you know. And uh, this isn't; these things aren't required, but they were under the law. And so Christ came to fulfill the law. And we see that here in his presentation in the temple. Um, the next thing in your notes, the fourth event about his infancy is, of course, the visit of the wise men. And uh, we, won't, we won't spend a lot of time on that. We just got, we got some bigger things that we need to talk about. And we talked about that at Christmas time. Uh, and then the flight into Egypt. The flight into Egypt. And we again, we were not going to really spend a lot of time on that. You just remember how Herod killed all the babies two years old and under. And uh, the angel warned them and they fled. And they fled down into Egypt. And then when the angel told them it was okay, they went back to Nazareth. Okay? So you understand all that. Now, you're in Luke 2. Let me give you the next statement in your hand. I don't think you have this yet. There is only one event recorded concerning the boyhood of Jesus. And that's found in Luke 2.39. And uh, we just read part of that verse. Let's go to Luke 2.39 again. Luke 2.39. It says, And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. Again, they're keeping the law. They're law keepers. Okay? They're gonna, the law is still in effect here. So they're going to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of the Passover. One of the Jewish feasts. Verse 42, and when he was 12 years old. So now Christ, no longer a baby, he is 12. And it says, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled uh, the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. When, and to save time, what happens here is they take off for home and they get a day's journey out and realize Jesus isn't with them. Well, as parents, would that concern you a little bit? Yeah, and so they're, they're concerned. And, uh, and, and Mary's like, I thought you got him, Joseph. And Joseph, I thought you got him, Mary. And, uh, you know, they're, they're sinners, and I'm sure they, you know, fussed a little bit. I, you know, how could you do this? You know, and, uh, and so they, they, they hightail it back to Jerusalem, and, uh, and when they get there, they cannot believe what they see. Verse 46, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his what? Understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother, wouldn't you be amazed? It says, And, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrow. Now, this is important. Look at verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not? In other words, didn't you know that I must be about my what? Father's business. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. This is uh, significant. That's the first recorded words of Jesus. And so Jesus is now at 12 years old, church. He is now divinely conscious of his parentage. And from now on, he must give full recognition to the truth that his father is the one which is in heaven. But he also is humbly submitting to his mother and foster father, if you will. So it's amazing. Look at the last verse there, verse 52. Well, let's go to verse 51. I think that's important. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart, just as any good mom would do. Right, ladies? Some of you ladies can tell me things your kids said when they were five years old, right? 
And so she kept these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, 12 years old, guess what? He's going to be 30 before we get any more information. So that means there's eight in your handout. It says uh, the next 18 years of Jesus' life are passed in holy silence until his baptism by John, John the Baptist. So what went on in those 18 years? Well, we won't know really until we get to heaven, will we? Uh, those 18 years from 12 years old to 30, uh, I'm going to assume because it's really the, the, informa the only information that we have, and we've got to make an assumption based on the information we have, what was, what was Joseph's occupation? Carpenter. He's the carpenter's son, the Bible says. So I'm going to assume that from the 12 years old to, to uh, 30, that uh, Jesus was a carpenter, and that he helped Joseph in the carpenter's shop, and he built cabinets, and he built furniture, and uh, I just, just one of those thoughts you have, wouldn't you love to have had a stick of furniture Jesus built? Whew. Wow. Well, you know it was built just right. You know it was built with just the right measurements. Everything was perfect on it. You know it was just right. And so that's, you know, that's, that's what he did. The Bible says he went down and he submitted to him. He subjected himself to his parents in all things. So he did what kids do. You know, he helped. He, he was an apprentice, I'm sure, under his father, and he worked in the carpenter shop. And uh, that's a, a pretty neat thought for some of you guys out there that like construction. Brother Sonny, I'm looking at you back there, and, and uh, boy, I tell you, I'd like to have had a, a building or a piece of furniture or something that, that Christ put together. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? But uh, he's 30 now, and he uh, is baptized by John. Go with me over to, uh, just skip over to Luke. We'll just go there for, for time's sake. In Luke uh, 3, Luke chapter 3, uh, let's go to verse 21. It says, now, <coughs> now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Uh, a question, why was Christ baptized by John? Uh, that's a subject that we covered in depth uh, when we went through that series, 10-week series on, on baptism. Uh, and I encourage you to go back online and listen to that if you missed it. But basically we said there were four reasons, and I'm just going to spit them out. You can catch it, and like I said, you can go back and listen to it. There's four reasons why Christ was baptized there. And the first one is he was, it was a submission to the righteousness of the law. He said that, that, that he needed to fulfill all righteousness, he told John. And so it was a fulfillment of the righteousness of the law. Um, before a person could, uh, could, could go into the priesthood of Israel, they had to, uh, they, they, they had to be uh, washed in water and they had to be anointed with oil. And so here we see Jesus in the water and then anointed with the Holy Spirit, the oil of the Holy Spirit. And so it was a submission to the righteousness of the law. The, the second thing, it was that it was an identification with the believing remnant of Israel. You got the believing remnant of Israel, small remnant, and they're coming to be baptized. He's identifying himself with that remnant by being baptized. The third thing, third reason, is when Christ was baptized, it was a manifestation to Israel that he was the Christ. He was the Messiah. And then the, the fourth reason is that he, that he was baptized is that it was, it was like an ordination of Christ into his public ministry. It's what, it's what got it going and started out. So in submitting to water baptism, he formally identified himself with the public expectation of the kingdom and the believing remnant of Israel. So it's a public consecration of himself to his messianic calling. And now he's full of the Holy Spirit, Luke 9, 1, and he's equipped to accomplish the work that he has. Um, in your handout, it says that Jesus' earthly ministry began in John 2 with the miracle at the uh, marriage in Cana of Galilee. It was followed by, let me just give you these real quick. You ready to write? It was followed by the healing of the sick, the calling of his disciples, 
teaching the multitudes, teaching the multitudes, his parables and discourses, and then lastly, his demonstration of power over nature, demons, and death. Let me give you the next statement. Jesus Christ showed himself as a spotless, sinless example in every way. The Bible says that he became sin for us on that cross who knew no sin, Paul said. Paul said that Jesus knew no sin. Hebrews 4, 15 says that he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet what? Without sin. 1 Peter 2.22, Peter, who lived with Jesus for three and a half years, and boy, don't you get to know people when you live with them. Couldn't you tell me about the sins of your family members, amen? But Peter basically lived and traveled with Christ for three and a half years. Peter said in 1 Peter 2.22 that he did no sin. There was no guile in his mouth. 1 John 3, 5, same thing. John, again, who walked with Christ in his earthly ministry, said that he did no sin. So now, all that left, all that's left after his earthly ministry, all that remained now for him was to settle the sin question and then to conquer death and complete the work of redemption, which we're going to look at in detail next week. We'll, we're going to have a whole C on the cross, which you probably figured one of the C's would be the cross, right? And so next week, we'll spend a whole week on that. But, but what I want to do here in the, the, last, the last part of our lesson tonight is I want to talk a little bit, which I, I've taught this series before years ago, but I didn't get into this, and so this is all kind of new material that we didn't get into the first time. I've kind of rewritten it, revamped it, re revised it, you know. And so I want to give you some material that I, that I haven't given you. I mean, I have in other, in other lessons at other times but I, I want to remind you of some things, okay? And that is this. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is very crucial that you rightly divide God's Word, okay? Because you can get really confused. I mean, listen, folks, you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John thinking, well, I'm just going to read about Jesus' earthly ministry, and you can read some of the things He taught, and you can read some of the things that happened, and you can just scratch your head, and you can get as confused as a termite in a yo-yo. I'm serious. You can get very confused. I mean, I've had new Christians come up to me, and they got Matthew in their hand. They got Matthew in their hand. They're like, what in the world is this? If, you're, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. You, you know, if, if your hand offends you, cut it off. You know, what's this verse here in Luke? Sell everything you have and give it away. You know, what's this stuff about, you know, uh, 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 going and present yourself to the priest, you know, and, and boy, you read some of that, and, uh, you know, you read verses like, uh, take no thought for tomorrow. Don't give any thought for tomorrow. Well, even what you're going to eat or drink or any clothes, don't give any thought for it. And you think, whoa, wow, okay. So throw away my grocery list. Get rid of my savings accounts. Get rid of my insurance. If I'm going to obey what Jesus said. So you see my point? You can read, you know, don't lay up treasures on earth. That's a command. Don't do it, Christ said. So you read some of that, and you can get really confused. All right? So you, you have, and, and I'm going to clear up the confusion, hopefully, for you, and give you a basis for understanding Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In your handout, and really most of everything is in the handout. I wanted you to get it. So let's just go through it. It says in your handout, reading of Christ's earthly life and ministry is a tremendous blessing. But we must remember the purpose of Christ's earthly ministry. What was his purpose for coming and ministering on earth? Well, the Bible says in Romans 15, 8, he was a minister of the circumcision. Who, what nation is the circumcision? Israel. He was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. In your handout, it says that Jesus came to minister to his people Israel. Go to Matthew 15, 24 real quick if you'll turn over there. He came to minister to his people Israel and to save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. Now we're going to get more revelation later from Paul that he died for all men. 
that all might be saved. He gave his life a ransom for all. But in the Gospels, it's, he came to save his people from their sins. And so uh, go, to, uh, go to Matthew. Remember, the Bible's a book of progressive revelation. Matthew 15, verse number, um, let's go to verse number 24. Jesus said here, he answered and said, I am not sent. This is his earthly ministry now. I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of who? Israel. So who did he come to minister to? Israel. Are you Israel? No, you're not Israel. Okay? And when you read, and there are people who talk about how, well, we're Israel now. Well, okay, you need to really do some study on that. Because every single time you see the word Israel used by the Apostle Paul or in the New Testament, it is always uh, speaking of that physical nation of the Jews, okay? Um, let's go to the next statement in your handout. It says, during the Gospels, there was still a middle wall of partition between Israel and Gentiles, with Israel enjoying great spiritual privilege. So... There's still that middle wall. That's why he said, I'm not sent. And that's why, by the way, go back to Matthew 10. Go back to Matthew chapter 10. This isn't in your notes. If you want to write down this reference, you can. Matthew 10, when he sends out the uh, disciples and he commissions them, he gives them a great commission here. Matthew 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of who? House of Israel. Is that our commission today, yes or no? Of course not. But that was at that time. Why? There's still a middle wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles. The prophetic program is still operative, and the prophetic program called for Israel to be converted first, and then through their conversion, they'd be a blessing and a witness and a testimony to the Gentile nations. It wasn't that God didn't love the Gentiles. It's simply the prophetic order. Israel first, and then you would go out to the Gentiles. That, that, was, that was the order, okay? Now, in your handout, it says that Matthew through John is not the grace dispensation that we live in today. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Are we under the Old Testament law system, yes or no? Clearly, Paul taught in Romans 7. I don't know how it could get any clearer than this. And people will still debate with you about it. I don't understand it. But, but, but people, people will still debate with you over this. But in Romans 7, 6, Paul said, but now, but now, we're in the but now period. We're not in time past program where there's the wall and where, and where the law is operative. He says, but now we are delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held. Now, can that get any clearer? I mean, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Now, go to Matthew 5 and let's see during Christ's earthly ministry if that was the case. Matthew 5, just a little bit more in the A's now if you could. Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said, think not that I am come to what? Destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what, church? Fulfill. I came to fulfill it. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, talking about the law of Moses, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them. Now, would you say the law of Moses is still operative according to that verse? Absolutely. He says, if whoever will do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So you got Jesus saying, you need to do the law and teach the law. You got Paul over here saying, we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. So are those the same, yes or no? No, I, I can clearly see when things are different, okay? And, and that's different. That's clearly different. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the reason why. Think with me. 
The law of Moses is the Old Testament, that old covenant agreement that God made with, with, with the nation of Israel. And it was confirmed by the blood of, of the sacrifice of animals. It was confirmed with blood. Now, could there be a New Testament without the shedding of blood, yes or no? According to Hebrews chapter 9, 15 and 16, a testament is of no effect until the death of the testator. There cannot be a New Testament until the shedding of the blood. Therefore, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are basically, those books are all before the cross work. Cross work doesn't come till the very end of those books. Then according to Hebrews 9, 15, and 16, do the events in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, would they fall under the Old Testament or the New Testament? The Old, clearly. They, they, and that's why you see Christ saying, do the law, teach the law. That's why you see Christ telling the ten lepers, go present yourself to the priest. Why would he tell them to go present themselves to the priest? He's the son of God. Because that's what the law of Moses told them to do. That's just one example of it. People say, well, what about John 1, 17? The law, you know, the, the, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And they'll say, see there, uh, you know, he did away. That verse doesn't say anything about him doing away with the law. It's simply making a statement that when Christ showed up, he was the embodiment of grace and truth. Listen, folks, without Christ, there'd be no grace and there'd be no truth. He is truth. He is grace. He's the embodiment of it. So when Christ showed up, he was the embodiment of grace and truth. He revealed the glory of the Father. And that's what the point is. A greater than the law of Moses had come on the scene and would come for a purpose and a reason. But, but, but we are not in the grace dispensation that we're in today in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Therefore, when you read those books, if you try to read those and make all that doctrine fit into today as a Gentile in the time of grace, you're going to have a hard time doing that. You're going to try to take a square peg and, and, and fit it in a round hole. It's not going to work. In your handout, it says the New Testament could not take effect until after the blood was shed by Christ. I'm going to bring up a chart that uh, is just a basic timeline. You see me use this all the time. It's just a good chart to kind of give, give you an understanding. You got the Old Testament law system. Christ comes to preach and teach it, fulfill it. And uh, he comes on the scene here, and then he gives his life on the cross. Okay, just, just that's, that's what the law required, see? It required that death, that payment. And so he's fulfilling the payment there of the law there on the cross. Of course, three days later, he rose from the dead, and then 40 days later, he ascends up to the right hand of the Father. And then, you've got in Acts chapter 9, you have um, the Apostle Paul getting saved, and the Apostle Paul receives revelation directly from Jesus Christ about a mystery that had never been revealed. It was a mystery. A mystery means something hitherto unrevealed. And so now this mystery is uncovered. It had been kept secret since the world began, and now it's been revealed. And uh, if we'll bring up the next click there, if you can bring that up, that's the time of grace that we're living in today. Okay, This time of grace, the mystery that was revealed through Paul, obviously they're not living in that time back here. The blood hadn't been shed. It hadn't been revealed yet. There is no Paul, none of that. So they're still operating under that old covenant back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with some additional new revelation that Christ has given them about the events that are going to happen up here. If you take out that parenthesis, okay, if we could do that. Can you take that back out? All right, here's the way an Old Testament saint saw the timeline. They saw, okay, the law given. They saw the prophecy of a Messiah. Christ comes as the fulfillment of that. And then he ascends up here until God makes his enemies his footstool. In other words, when he ascends to the right hand of the Father, he sits down until his enemies are made his footstool. In other words, God's going to pour his wrath out on Christ's enemies. And so they saw this happening 
then the wrath being poured out here for seven years, and then they saw the fulfillment of prophecy with Christ coming down here at the second coming and the establishment of that kingdom on earth that God promised Israel. They saw all this happening back to back. Boom, boom, boom. Enemies are made his footstool. Boom, he comes back, makes war with his enemies, sets up the kingdom. What the Old Testament saints didn't see because it was hidden in God from the foundation of the world, it was kept secret, is that, and we'll bring up the click again, that's the time of grace, the mystery time period that we live in today. So when we talk about the Gospels, and we talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which fall right back here, there are three things happening in these books simultaneously. You basically have three things going on. It's in your handout. Let me give it to you. Number one... Christ is calling his people Israel to repentance. Repent, he tells them, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That kingdom that's going to come from heaven to earth that's been prophesied, it's near if you'll receive it. It's near. It's at hand. He said, John the Baptist is that Elijah which was to come if you would receive it. And see, so he comes and he's calling Israel to repent because they're in a state of complete spiritual rebellion and spiritual apathy. Number two, the second thing going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Christ is preparing the little flock of believing Israel, that little remnant of believers. He's preparing them for the future time of wrath and their coming kingdom to earth. All right, if we could bring the chart back up, please. Okay, look, look up here. Bring up the whole chart. Now, look, look up here, church. He's back here telling them to repent, okay, and uh, emphasizing the law of Moses, and he's telling them to repent of how they've broken it. But he's also, with that, giving them some new additional information because they're going to have to go through seven years of tribulation, and then that'll be followed by their kingdom on earth, which they're going to need doctrine for that period too. So Christ is giving them doctrine that they're going to need here and here. They're going to have to be prepared for it. And so he's giving them doctrine. Of course, now we look back and see that, uh, you know, we see this. And so, you know, the doctrine that he gave is going to be very applicable during this period and this period in the future. And, and the saints in the tribulation and in the kingdom, of course, are going to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and derive their doctrine, much of their doctrine from there, see? And so Christ is preparing them for the future out here. So he's emphasizing this, but he's also giving them new revelation and information about this, okay? Now, look at the third thing in your handout. It says Christ is preparing to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. So you got three things going on. He's calling Israel to repentance. He's preparing the little flock for the coming kingdom. And then he's preparing himself as a sacrifice for sin. Now, we can look back in the Gospels and clearly see that. But let me ask you something. Did the people living during Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John time period, did they understand and did the twelve understand and did the twelve disciples, were they going out preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Yes or no? In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go to Matthew 16, since you're already there. Matthew chapter 16. I'm almost done. Matthew 16, verse 21. You can also read Luke 18, 31 through 34. But let's go to Matthew 16, 21 and 22. It says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And then Peter said, Woo, whoopee, there's going to be a sacrifice for sin. Is that what he said? No, it says he took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter doesn't say, All right, yes, that's what we've been preaching. He says, What? You're going to do what? Uh-uh. Go to Luke real quick, Luke 18. I just want you to see it. Luke 18, 31. Turn over there, Luke 18, 31. so funny, you know. You, you hear preaching and preachers will make it sound like, yeah, 
you know, Peter and James and John and the twelve, they're out there in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're out there preaching the gospel. Like, like they're preaching the same thing we're preaching today. Well, no, they didn't have that information yet. They're preaching the information they had. And the information they had up to that point was that the kingdom of heaven's at hand. This is the Messiah. This is the guy. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the real deal. This is the one we've been waiting on. And you need to repent because the kingdom's at hand. That's what they're preaching. See? And they're not preaching what we're preaching. Look at, verse, look at Luke 18, 31. It says, Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they what? Understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So were they out preaching the death, burial, and resurrection in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Yes or no? Clearly not. Clearly not. And there's nothing wrong with it. They were preaching exactly what Christ told them to preach. They were preaching the information they had. Okay? Now, it says in your handout, of course, hidden in God was a secret that God would eventually reveal years later to the Apostle Paul. This mystery that God revealed involved a time of unprecedented grace for the world in which God would offer salvation and grace to all people on an absolutely equal basis. And that's that parentheses up on the chart. If you bring that back up behind me, that's the parentheses right there. That's the mystery that was revealed to Paul. Aren't you glad we live in that time of grace? Aren't you glad God decided to pour out grace on the world and uh, extend an offer of grace and peace to all people on an absolutely equal basis? What's the basis of the offer of grace and peace? What's the basis of the offer? How can God make the offer of grace and peace? It's based on what? The finished and completed work of who? Jesus Christ. And we're going to take a closer look at that next week, okay? So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, thank you.